Amen. Okay. All right. So, my title is Catch, Pierce, and Release. The way I am going to explain it is not going to be in that order, just letting y'all know. It will make sense in the end, though. So if y'all can read together with me, um, it's on y'all's handout, it's Ephesians 1.13. And, all right. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. I'm not going to go over that right now. Okay. We're going to come back to it in the end, and then you're, it's going to just make sense, and it's just going to come together. Amen. All right, so if everyone can turn to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis? Give me an amen when you're there. Amen. 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 And I'm going to read until 17. Okay. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant, which I have, which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all the all flesh that is on the earth. Okay, so everybody knows what the rainbow symbolizes, right? When we see it in the clouds, right? It represents God's promise to all living creatures, beings on earth, that he will never flood the earth again. I'm reading this in the New King James Version, but I, when I was reading this in the King James Version, I noticed something, or the Lord led me to notice something. It doesn't say rainbow in the King James Version. It says bow or bow. And me being me, I didn't know which one it was, and I like to act like, well, well I really don't, pretend like I don't know anything. So using the app, I went to go look at the Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word for bow is Keshet. Keshet is spelled Q-E-S-E-T. Keshet. And it means bow for battle or hunting, bowmen, archers, bending a bow for shooting, figuratively strength. So it's like, okay, so it is talking about a bow. It's talking about a bow and arrow. And I was like, well, it makes sense, right? Because we are in a spiritual warfare, are we not? Come on. Yes. We need more than one weapon to fight yes. against the principalities. Yes. So it makes sense why we would need a bow. Amen. So now I'm just thinking about the basics of a bow. What is a bow used for? A bow is used to shoot an arrow. <laughs> it's used for hunting. That one gets to that later. But uh, right now, the, <laughs> the bow is used to stabilize the arrow for a straight shot. And it requires strength for us to bend the string back. So then I started thinking, well, if a normal rainbow, when you see in the sky, it represents a promise. The bow is something that we hold on to. Are we not holding on to his promises? Come on. So it's just like. So good. <laughs> Whew, okay. <laughs> so good. And then it was just like, well, that's not the only promise we hold on to. We don't only hold, hold on to the promise of him never flooding the earth again. We hold on to the promise of what Jesus did on the cross for us. We hold on to the promise of what his blood does for us, that it saves us, that it brings us salvation, it brings us liberation, it brings us freedom. And not only that, that he helps us become righteous. His blood helps us become righteous to where we can be adopted, to where we can be children, true children of the Lord. Because everyone can say they they have they believe in everything, but if they're not walking in it, then they're not true children, they are they? Come on, come on. Come on. I can't, that wasn't even practice. I can't, okay. <laughs> Amen. 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 Okay. Holy Spirit, have your way. 
So the rainbow, the rainbow represents our stable covenant with God. It represents Jesus. He is our bow. And another thing, in the definition for bow, it says bending a bow for shooting figuratively strength. And like I said, it takes strength for us to bend the bow back, right? Mm -hmm. Whose strength do you think we're using? Mm -hmm. One. One. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A lot of people like to reference that. A lot of people like to use that on their day to day. But they don't understand that you have to go through Christ to use his strength. Amen. If you're doing yeah. something he did not call you to do, if you're doing something he did not will you to do, if you're doing something because you want to do it and he didn't tell you to do it, he's not going to give you the strength to do it. Come on. Right now. Yes. Amen. 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 He gives us his strength when we do for his will and for his kingdom. That is when we'll get his strength. All right. Now that I've shown that rainbows also means a bow, I want to go back to just the basics of a rainbow. So, as we all know, a rainbow usually comes after a storm, and as the verse says, it's seen in the clouds. So storms normally represent our trials and tribulations. Like that song, I'm going through a storm. So that's what the storm normally represents. We go through trials and tribulations because we need to strengthen our faith, we need to test our faith. If um, so the Lord knows that we truly do believe and follow him. If we're going through a trial and we immediately like backpedal, mm -hmm. that's not having true faith. Mm, come on. So the storms are there for that. The storm's also there for us to have a test so we can have a testimony. Amen. The storms are there so we can be pruned and so we can bear fruit. Amen. So storms are very essential. And it's kind of crazy that the storm comes before the rainbow comes before the promise. Ooh, come on, you better preach. Where's my shoe? <laughs> Don't hit anybody. Okay. No, come on, come on. Amen. Come on. So then I was like, it's seen in the clouds, like the verse says. I was like, in the clouds, in the clouds. I know I've seen that somewhere else, but I don't really know what it means. So I looked at the definition, and the Hebrew word is anon. Anon spelled A-N-A-N. -A -N. Anon means thundercloud, cloud mass, and theophanatic cloud. Now, again, me being me, I didn't know what theophanatic meant. <laughs> so I had to Google. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Pastor Ben. I had to Google. <laughs> uh, so what it says, theophanatic means a visible manifestation of divine presence. A visible, wow. visible manifestation. Manifestation also means a revealing, a, a visible revealing of divine presence. There's only one being we call divine. So it's a visible revealing of God's presence. That's what in the clouds mean. And essentially, that's really all you need, to, uh, all I really need to do it, but we're gonna go to uh, Luke um, chapter 21. So good. Mm -hmm. Amen. Give me a holla, holla, if you're there. Holla, 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 holla. Amen. Are you there? Okay. We're going to start in verse 25. Okay. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Right. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because you because because your redemption draws near. Amen. Man, come on. They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. God's power and glory appears in the clouds just like a rainbow. Mm -hmm. A rainbow appears in the clouds after a storm. His glory manifests in our lives after we have been refined in that storm. Because when we're going through a storm, he's refining us. We're going through troubles. But as long as we keep our eyes focused on him, we will get out of that storm. And once we have been refined, once we have, once he has helped us create a testimony, once we have passed the test, essentially, he will pull us out of the storm with his power. And it will be shown, his power and his glory will be shown through our testimonies and our fruit. 
because he's the only reason we have fruit to begin with. The only reason why we have testimonies to begin with. Amen. Okay, so, so far we've discussed the rainbows, we discussed the bows, realizing that the rainbow represents our promise with him, represents our covenant with him, and Oh, Lord. Okay, so <laughs> now that we know um, that we have votes, how do we receive our votes? That's my question. So Romans chapter 4. That's where we're going to turn to. Amen. 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 Wait. I ain't even there yet. <laughs> Sorry. I'm having a brain. I got a little competitive. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope and hope believed so that he become a father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider it his own body, already dead since he, he was about to about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So I'm going to stop right there. The very first verse, verse 13, tells us how we receive our bows. It says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. It says, For the promise, as we already established, the bow represents the promise that he made. Through the righteousness of faith is when we're going to receive it. So we receive our bows when we establish our faith in Jesus Christ. Come on. So we good. receive our bows when we receive Jesus. Man. But I want us to look at 416 because I don't want anyone to get prideful saying it's my faith that got me a bow, okay? All right. Verse 16 says, therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. It says, according to grace. His grace is the only reason why we're able to have faith, why we're able to establish that faith Amen. because of his grace. And his grace wasn't there, then we ain't got no faith, we ain't got no bows. So as we already know, faith means pistis. And hearing that word a lot lately. Pistis means conviction of the truth. His, whose truth, like I said earlier? God's truth. It's God's truth. We don't have a truth, okay? We don't have a truth to live out. He's our only truth. So we get we establish our faith when we turn that condemnation into conviction. Mm -hmm. When we are no longer offended, but we let it correct us. Yes. When we change what we considered a lie into the actual truth that it is. So our faith, because of his grace, is what helps us receive our bows. Now I want us to look at verse 20. I want to point something out. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. Waver. I, want, I looked up the word waver. It also means staggered. And uh, the word is the acronym. I don't have to say it. Yeah, girl. It has something, something with a girl. I can't do it. So, uh, staggered means, or waver means to separate, to withdraw, to doubt. So, he did not doubt. He did not separate himself from the Lord. He did not withdraw himself from the Lord. He did not waver at the promise of God. So, wh what does that mean to me? That means that we can lose our bows. Oh. And that's another Come thing on. too, like with the whole he will not forsake us, he will not abandon us. That goes in line with 
is because we abandon him. We forsake him. He Come doesn't on. do that to us. So when we lose our bows, it's because we decide to drop it off somewhere. We just oh, left it somewhere yeah. in a cab, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's our own fault if we lose our bows. Now, how do we lose our bows? He said he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Unbelief can cause us to lose our bows. And as a... Uh, okay. Okay. So... So what does that mean to me? That also means we need to have belief to keep our bow. Because I ain't worried about losing it. I'm worried about keeping the same thing. Okay? So what is belief? We should already know what belief is. Belief is pastillo, right? Pastillo looks a lot like pistachio to me. Like, <laughs> And what does pastillo mean? Pastillo means place confidence in. When we go through a storm and we have that faith, we need to place our confidence in it, confidence in him through that storm. We need to put our faith in, into action. Belief is our faith in action. To not lose our bows, we need to have both faith. We need our faith to receive it. We need our belief to keep it. Amen. So, and like I said earlier, I know here it's talking about the promise he's talking about is the promise of, of him bearing a child. I know that. But when I when y'all see the word promise, I just want to think think of not only all the promises, but the ultimate promise that we lean on so heavenly. The ultimate promise that we have faith in. The ultimate promise we put our belief in. And that is Jesus Christ. Amen. So Abraham not only strengthened his faith going through the trials, but he proved his faith by holding on to the promises, by placing his confidence in God, by having the belief, because our God is a faithful God. Amen. Is he not? Amen. Amen. So, we can go run through it real quick. The bow represents God's promise that we hold on to. It requires his strength for us to be able to utilize this weapon for his kingdom. A rainbow represents not only his promise, but his power and glory revealing himself after we go through a storm, through our testimonies and the fruit we bear. We receive our bows when we establish faith. We keep our bows when we have belief. Through all of this, we are building a stable, intimate relationship with God the Father, and we are renewing our minds to go through, go to go with our new ways, which are really His ways, and we are holding on to His promises. We are holding on to the bow. Amen. Now, we have a bow. That must mean we have an arrow, right? So what's our arrow? Let's go to Psalm 64. Give me an amen when you get there. What happened? No, I can't. I'm so fast. Amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> I don't know why you're worried. I'm going to be the last one every time. Okay. I'm just trying to be more person than you. Amen. No times. Okay. So I really only need um, two verses out of this, but I love God's word, so we're going to read the whole chapter. Okay. It's short. It's okay. Okay. Hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the, from the rebellion of the workers of inequity, who sharpen their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They talk of lying snares secretly. They say, who will, we, who will see them? They devise inequities. We have perfected a shrewd scheme. Both the inward thought and the heart of man are deep. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. So he will make them stumble over their own tongue. All who see them will, shall flee away. All men shall fear and shall declare the works of God. For they shall wisely consider his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and trust in him. And all the upright in heart shall glory. Mm -hmm. So, I want us to focus on verse 3 right now. Who sharpen their tongues like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrow. Bitter words. Now, I know this is from a perspective of the enemy, right? They're the ones shooting the bows. But as we know, the enemy likes to copycat what God does. He's going to send a copycat Jesus. So why wouldn't he cop and why wouldn't he copycat Jesus in every sense of the way? 
we already learned or found out that the enemy also has a sword. Why would it be any different for a bow and arrow? So if the enemy's arrows are bitter words, what are God's arrows? God's arrows are his words. We already established that he has a bow and it's confirmed in verse 7, but God shall shoot at them with an arrow. So he has a bow and arrow. And because he has it, we have it. So if his arrows are his words, then our arrows are his words. Good. If we look at the um, Hebrew word for it, I'm not going to try to say it. It's not even how, it, how it's spelled. It's, yeah. It means, <laughs> arrow means a piercer. What else do we know pierces? The sword, the double-edged sword pierces. The double-edged sword also represents his word. So if the arrow also pierces, then it also represents his word. Amen. And this was a little tidbit that I thought was cool, because it also means figuratively thunderbolt. Made me think back to the rainbow. In the rainbow, the bow, it also meant thundercloud. <laughs> Thundercloud, okay, so we just realized that in the clouds is the rainbow. The rainbow up here is thundercloud, and thunderbolts come out of a thundercloud. Mm -hmm. Arrow, wait, no, bow shoots out an arrow because the arrow is the thunderbolt. So, thunderbolt, thundercloud, bow, arrow. I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, when a thunderbolt shoots out an arrow, it shoots it out during a storm. Which I, which was like, okay, yeah, that does happen during the storm. So therefore, our arrows are not only God's words, but it's our fruit that we bear while we're in the storm. Amen. Our attitudes, our characters, yes, that we carry in our walk. It's our testimonies that we share when the storm has cleared. Amen. So the arrow is God's words. The arrow is our testimonies. The arrow is our fruit. Amen. And just like we have to bend our bows to shoot, we have to bend our tongues to speak. Oh! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amen. So good. Okay. And uh, just because I want to point out more that arrows are words, Jeremiah chapter 9. to bend our bows to shoot we have to bend our tongues to speak we can't shoot if we're not speaking we need to speak we need yeah. to know his words to speak it yes I am <laughs> Amen. so good okay so now we know we have a bow we know how to get the bow we know what our arrow is who are we aiming for all right we can't just go shooting everybody. Come on. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be crazy. That'd be wild. Okay? Let's go to um, 2 Kings, verse 13. Okay. Okay. Amen. Chapter 13. Amen. <laughs> yeah, chapter 13. We're going to uh, start with... Wait. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. No, I'm right, but I'm, I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> We're going to start in verse 14. <clears throat> so Elijah had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, Joash 
the king of Israel came down to him and weeped over his face and said, O oh my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elijah said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hands on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elijah, and Elijah put his hands on the king's hands, and he said, Open the east window, and he opened it. But Elijah said, Shoot, and he shot, and he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and of the arrow of deliverance, from Syria, for you have st struck the Syrians at a thief till you have destroyed them. I'm butchering words, I'm sorry. But um, I want us to look at this part. The arrow of the Lord's deliverance. Mm. Ooh, okay, so as we all know, when we hear the word deliverance, we all kind of have an idea of what we think it is, right? I mean, we can't even cough at church without someone thinking you're manifesting. <laughs> all looking like manifestation? Deliverance? Anyone? Anyone? Deliverance? <laughs> but like I said, I like to pretend that I don't know anything. Because I really don't. So, I looked into the word deliverance. Deliverance, the Hebrew word is teshua. Teshua means salvation in a spiritual sense. Rescue, help, deliverance usually by God through human agency. So this definition not only shows who we're mainly aiming at, but it reconfirms what our arrows are. So, who do we try to rescue? Who do we try to help? What was that, Trev? Yep. Um, <laughs> the unbelievers, the ones that are lost. The lost. We are trying to save and help the lost. We're trying to bring them, trying to bring them salvation, trying to bring them the truth so that they can be set free. We try to spread the gospel, evangelize to those that are lost because it grieves us that they don't know that they are in the spiritual warfare. I don't know about you guys, but when I think about people that are lost who don't know, it grieves me. Yes. I make some posts sometimes and some people put laughing emojis and it grieves me that they don't even understand what they're laughing at. It grieves us because it grieves our Father. Yes. Because even though it grieves me that they're lost, it grieves me more that it grieves Him. Amen. Yes. The loss is who we are trying to bring deliverance and salvation through to by spreading the gospel to them, by telling them the good news. Because that's what gospel means. It means good news. Yeah. The gospel also means it in, uh, it includes both the promise of salvation and its fulfillment by the life, death, resurrection, and ascension, ascension of Jesus Christ. So this definition, gospel, confirms what our arrows are. So I'm going to break it down real quick. Gospel, we think it's just about it in the basic sense. Gospel, we just like God's word, right? That's the basic sense of gospel. Without looking into the definition, we automatically think gospel means God's word. So arrows, God's word. And we're spreading the gospel, we're spreading his word. It also includes both the promise of salvation and its fulfillment by the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. There was one day when I was uh, having a little mini Bible study with Marissa. Mm -hmm. Trev was there, but he didn't join until later. Yeah. Um, but me and her have established that Jesus Christ has his own testimony. Amen. So good. Yeah. So, arrows, as we said earlier, represents our testimony. The arrow represents his testimony. And which is crazy is that his testimony is part of our testimony. That's so good, yes. Wow. Amen. Whew, okay. So the arrows are God's words. The arrows are meant to pierce the hearts of the lost to bring them deliverance and salvation. That is what we're aiming for. We're aiming for their hearts. We're aiming for their hearts to pierce it. Because they don't even know that they're spiritually dead. They don't even know that they're walking in their flesh. And as we know, flesh brings nothing but death. Right. And when we pierce something, as normally with bows and arrows, you're meant for hunting, right? That means you're trying to kill something. Well, in the sense, we are trying to kill something when we're piercing their hearts. We're trying to kill the activities of the soon-to-be dead man. Yeah. Yeah. We're killing that the dead man. We're bringing them life. We're bringing them Christ. Okay. 
And like I said, the arrow is also our fruit. Because if we go back to the definition of deliverance, deliverance usually, deliverance usually by God through human agency. Human agency means the ability of people to shape their lives and make choices that affect their circumstances. Our fruits, our attitudes, our characters is also our arrows. Because we can bring them, it says here, deliverance usually by God through human agency. God will use us to bring in his loss. God will use us to help those who are lost, to bring his children back to him, to get yes. them out of the pit of hell that they're headed to. Yes. Put them on the narrow path, away from the wide path that everybody else is on. Yes. Yes. That's why we got to be careful what we say and what we do, because people are watching whether you know it or not. That's right. Yeah. Come on. How we act and how we speak can either deter someone from God or bring them to God. We cannot, we must be careful in what we say, not only to not bring curses on ourselves and others, but because if we truly have faith and believe in God, then our lives, our attitudes should reflect that. How we live reflects who we live for. Okay. So. With the bow, God's promised our salvation, God himself, by his strength, we will be able to bend the bows, our tongues, and shoot, which is speaking, a straight, steady shot with arrow of deliverance to pierce the hearts, minds of the lost with God's words, our testimonies, and our fruit, leading them to Jesus so they can receive salvation, which is freedom, and understand we are only able to shoot a Stable, steady shot if we have a stable, steady relationship with our Ooh. Father. Oh, come on. That's so good. We also need to understand that a bow and arrow is used for hunting an animal, and it leads to killing. Like I said before, we are aiming to pierce their heart so that their dead men can die. We are aiming to kill their dead man. We need to get him out of the driver's seat. Amen. Hyperactive, hyperactive monkey. He needs to get out. He needs to be booted. Okay, so I established that we have a weapon, right? We have a bow and arrow, right? We also have a tool. So let's go to Luke chapter 5. Amen. 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 <laughs> amen. It didn't even sound like amen. It's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in verse 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of, I don't know the word, Gennesaret, Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fisherman had gone from them and was washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put, on a little, put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they, ooh, excuse me. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. So I know Pastor Ben revealed something a few weeks ago, um, but I'm going to put a little different spin on it. So ship, uh, or it says here, saw two boats, boats. It doesn't say boats in King James, it says ship. Ship, boat, same thing, right? So the I looked at the Greek word. The Greek word for ship is poion. Poion means sailor, and it means vessel makes sense. You need a sailor for a ship, right? right. Vessel is also another word for ship. So, if people, who don't know this, I had another revelation 
before with that word vessel. So I already kind of knew what this was being said. But for who, who don't know, vessel was a common Greek metaphor for body. Whose body is that? Our body, <laughs> right? So the ship, and are we not also a vessel for God to use, right? Amen. Yes. We are his vessels. Right. So the ship is us. So I'm going to kind of, not really reread it, but kind of skim through it. And this time I want us to imagine the ship being us. So we have two ships out there in the lake, two people out in the world, doing what the world does, doing what their dead man wants, doing what their flesh wants to do. They have two people out there, right? Um, and doing this, what is of the old ways, right? Because that's what uh, is pretty much Simon was doing here. He went back to his old ways after already meeting Jesus. This is, was him going back to his old ways. So these two ships are two people in their old ways doing what they know. Both are not satif satisfied because both of them are empty. They both come to shore. One has an encounter with Jesus. They hear about Jesus, someone evangelized to them, however they received it, one has an encounter and they receive it. They receive it because, I know they received it because Jesus gets on board with them. And that one, with the one that has Jesus, goes back out a little bit out into the, uh, the shore, right? And, and this is where Jesus starts talking. This is where he starts teaching. So this is like the ship, the person, is furthering their knowledge in Jesus. They're, they are reading the Bible. They are watching sermons. They're going to church. They're, they're trying to not only, they are not only hearing, no longer hearing it, they are now trying to understand it. They're trying to understand who Jesus is. So, so we have two ships. Both of them are empty. Both are unsatisfied. They both come back to shore. One has an encounter with Jesus, receives Jesus, hears about his promise, and lets him, let Jesus come aboard into their hearts, essentially. They go back out into the world with Jesus on board, where this is where they're starting to establish their faith. They receive further teachings about Jesus. They further their knowledge about who Jesus is. They receive the Holy Spirit. They build a deeper relationship with Jesus, and that's when they go deeper out into the world, where they go through a storm. Because if y'all remember, I don't remember exactly what verse or whatever, but what, what verse? I think it was in John. It's like, because after Jesus received the Holy Spirit after he was baptized, he immediately got pushed into the wilderness. So why wouldn't that be any different for us? When we received it, when we received his Holy Spirit, why wouldn't he put us in the wilderness to test our faith, to grow us? Yeah. <clears throat> so, as the ship out there with Jesus is out there, he has Jesus on board, and he does what he was trying to do before, but this time, Jesus' way, not their way. This time, God's way, not the world's way. They lean on God. They put their faith into action. They're believing. They, they, they then receive a blessing, produce fruit, and become filled. Because this is when he gets a multitude of fish. This is when they start catching things that they weren't catching before. So much so, they become filled. They become whole. That they're overflowing because they're <coughs> sinking. The ship is literally starting to sink, mm -hmm. so they're overflowing. They're filled up. He has yeah. filled them up. They get so excited about what they have not only discovered, but have experienced. They call out to the other ship, come over here, come receive your blessings, come receive this promise, come get filled so you're no longer empty. So now the ship is no longer just a listener. He is now a speaker. actually is. Amen. We need to be speaking out. We need to be sharing the gospel, our testimonies, and be an example. 
so that those who are lost, those who are empty, can get filled. They can discover, discover the truth, discover their true identity in Christ, and know the promise they can receive. Because that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a lot of the problem nowadays. When people go into go down the wrong path, it's because they don't know their identity. Well, they start grasping at anything they can take to figure out what their identity is, and they don't even realize the only way they can get their identity if they know Christ. He's the only one that can give you your true identity. Okay. And the reason why we need to be reaching out to those who are lost, the reason why it's so important, not only because we're helping God's kingdom, we're bringing him one of his lost, and it's not even us bringing them, it's him using us to bring them back to him. It's because they can reach someone we can't. Right. Because when we speak and the listeners receive, they can now speak and reach someone we could not before. Mm-hmm. They become another person to do the will of God. They're covering more ground in the garden. Because are we not? Are we not part of the garden? Mm-hmm. You can't just. If you have a giant, huge garden, two people cannot reach everybody in that garden. Yeah. One. So we're covering more ground, and we're reaching more people. Doing this also does not just save the lost either. It saves those who are lukewarm. Mm, Better preach. And I can testify to that being lukewarm. Thank God he pulled me out of that. Because I was leaning into my own understanding. And it was not good. I was thinking that that there was only one God. As in every religion served one God. And we just had different standards and different rules. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for making me no longer lukewarm, but hot. Amen. On fire for you, Lord. Amen. I want us to realize how awesome God is, that he's even wanting to save, save the lost, that he's even wanting to speak out and pull us out of the fire, that he's even wanting to give us that grace to where we can have belief, that he's even wanting to put us through tests so we can bear fruit. So that we can strengthen our faith in him, have that belief in him. Because when he gets correction, yes, it hurts. Yeah, it stings. Yeah, I don't want to hear it. More so my flesh doesn't want to hear it. But when he's correcting me, he does it out of love so I know he still loves me. Amen. If he wasn't correcting me, then I'm doing something wrong. So now I just want us to go back to that verse and I just want to look at the basics of um, Simon. Simon, as we found out, doubted. He was disobedient and he was an unbeliever. Simon was empty. Simon didn't change his mind completely until he was filled. Then Simon no longer doubted Jesus. He no longer was being an unbeliever in that sense. But he started doubting himself. Because if you read here, verse 8, and he says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Before that, he was being a smart aleck, was he not? Yeah. yeah. Saying, okay, I'll do it, because you said. Now he's like, depart from me. I'm unworthy of you. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Leave me, Lord. Isn't that how we all kind of feel? Mm-hmm. Like we're unworthy to even be in his presence. We're unworthy to be loved. Come on. Whew. What does what does Jesus do? Look at verse ten. Jesus said to Simon, "Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men." Amen. Amen. Okay. Jesus does not condemn Simon. Jesus does not shame him, guilt trip him, whack him. Or leave him. Jesus gives Simon a purpose. Jesus gives Simon a reason, gives him his calling, gives Simon worth. He gives Simon a promise. Because Jesus may know Simon the sinner, but Jesus also knows Peter the believer. Yes, amen. He knows Peter the disciple. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
what I want to take from this is I want us to realize, I know I haven't put it out yet, that we have a net. The amount of fish that they caught in this net is the amount of people we should be trying to speak to. Come on. We need to be speaking out. What are we so scared of? Why are we scared to speak out? Again, I'm speaking to myself too. Why are we so scared to speak out? The worst they can do is ignore us, okay. laugh at us, say they don't want anything to do with it. What do we do then? We dust off our shoes and we walk away. We take back our pros and we move on to the next. Yes. We don't dwell and their unbelief. We have a net. We have a net that we can use to capture a multitude of the lost. The reason why I say capture is because we need to capture their attention. We need to capture the lost attention and their ears. Because the way that the, this world works is that everything's a time. Rush, 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 rush. Mm -hmm. Someone's not gonna sit there for two hours and hear your testimonies and see how you live or hear about the word of God. They're not gonna sit there Come on. and listen. We gotta be able to capture their attention, say what we need, and I thought it was two minutes, but apparently it's, uh, one minute is all we have, if even. <laughs> and that's because this world has taught us that we need to rush and hurry. As many fish as they caught should be as many people we strive to bring the good news, good news to. And I want to point out the difference between a double-edged sword and bow and arrow. And because even though they both mean the word of God, they both have a different use in the scenarios. For instance, a double-edged sword, you need to be close to that person to pierce them, right? Right. You don't need to be close to a person to pierce them with a bow and arrow. Come on. As in, you don't need to know them to pierce them with a the bow and arrow. Yeah. As with the double-edged sword, you need to be close, right? Whenever we <laughs> have a service, uh, any pastor that's up there, <laughs> I feel like I'm getting skinned alive sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Which is good. <laughs> Praise God. And as we know, our services take like two, three hours, right? Mm -hmm. That's because I make, because we make time for it, right? That's why we get the sword. Because we're further on our walk, so we need to start skinning off that flesh. As for a bow and arrow, we don't need to be close to that person to pierce their hearts with salvation. We can just tell them the word, hope they receive it, and move on. Okay. So, I want to go back to Ephesians 1.13, which was our verse. I, I want to reread it, and I, I'm hoping that some light bulbs clicked. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also have believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. His promise, the bow. We heard it. We were once lost, were we not? We were once unbelievers. Someone had to literally tell us we had to hear the word of the truth to get us back on the straight path we had to hear of the gospel of the salvation that we can receive so that we can have faith so now we can go through a storm having that belief knowing that he will pull us out when when we are acting right that's the only reason why he'll pull us out of the storm if you're not acting right he's not gonna pull you out mm -hmm. <laughs> If you're not doing what he wants you to do in the storm, he's not going to pull you out of that storm. You can cry and mope all day. You're, you're not going to get out of it if you're not doing what he, what he had the purpose of the storm for. Right. Because as we know in Job, even though, I don't know if y'all noticed this, but God's the one that brought up Job. Not the enemy. He wasn't the one that brought him up first. Right. right. It was God. Yes. And even though God said yeah to whatever the Satan what Satan requested to do he put down rules mm -hmm. you can't do this and this and this and that you can't right. you can't harm Job you can't do that you can't kill him yeah. so even though we're going through a storm we will not he will not give us more than we can bear mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <sighs> 
So, I want us to realize that our weapon ballet is bigger than we think. We have more tools in our pockets than we like to let on. That we are hunters and we are fishers of men. We need to capture the attention of the lost by speaking, bending our bows, which is our tongues, about the word, truth of the gospel, and salvation. Literally, this, we have to plant a seed about the seed, guys. <laughs> we must pierce our hearts of the lost with our way of living, which is our fruit, character, and attitude, because we have people who are lost, lukewarm, watching us, watching our every step we take. Come on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, an example of that last week. Piercing their hearts with God's words, promised with Jesus. We are trying to lead them to Christ so they can kill the activities of their dead man. And then we must release them so they can reach places and people we cannot encounter or reach. Doing all this for his kingdom, his glory, and his lost children. Because none of this is possible without him. Yes. yes. I kind of do want to share it, but it's not mine to share, so never mind. <laughs> 